my, here's your host, John, with more classic movie reviews. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is The Hallelujah Trail, 1965. This movie is a western comedy that skewers everyone as competing groups try to intercept a wagon train filled with whiskey. This movie has a surprising cast of big stars led by Burt Reynolds and Lee Remick. We'll just jump right into the actors, and we've got a lot of show veterans. The Actors Burt Lancaster played the lead role of Colonel Thaddeus Gerhardt. The great Burt Lancaster was covered in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Pamela Tiffin played Louise Gerhardt, daughter of Colonel and follower of the Temperance Movement. Tiffin was covered in 123, 1961. Bing Russell played Horner, one of the miners. Russell was covered in episode 12, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, 1966. Dub Taylor played the head of the Denver Miners, Clayton Howell. Taylor was first covered in episode 15, The Undefeated, 1969. Whit Bissell played newspaper man Hobbs, who sets the events in motion. Bissell was covered in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Brian Keith played the role of Frank Wallingham, businessman and tax-paying Republican. Keith was covered in episode 37, The Violent Men, 1955. John Anderson played the role of Sergeant Buell. Anderson was born in 1922 in Illinois. He was primarily a television actor and left an incredible 242 credits at the end of his career. Anderson served in the Coast Guard during World War II. His career included stage work and television miniseries such as North and South, 1985. His credited movie career began as the car salesman in Psycho, 1960. Other films include Ride the High Country, 1962, Day of the Evil Gun, 1968, Soldier Blue, 1970, The Lincoln Conspiracy, 1977, where he reprised an uncredited Lincoln role from The Fortune Cookie, 1966, and Smokey and the Bandit, 1980. Anderson died in 1992 at the age of 69. Lee Remick played the hot-blooded temperance leader Cora Templeton Massingale. Lee Remick was born in Massachusetts in 1935, but I would have bet real money she was a Southern belle. At Barnard College, Lee studied dance. She also began working on stage and television. In her first role, she played a sexy baton twirler in A Face in the Crowd, 1957. This was followed by another belle role in The Long Hot Summer, 1958. This was followed by Anatomy of a Murder, 1959, where Lee played a huzzy whose husband was on trial for murdering a man that allegedly raped her. Lee was in several other movies, but for playing an alcoholic in Days of Wine and Roses, 1962, she was nominated for an Oscar. She was great in The Hallelujah Trail, 1965, Standing Up to the Colonel, played by Burt Lancaster. She had a role in Sometimes a Great Notion, 1970, in the demonic tale The Omen, 1976, and the Cold War thriller Telephone, 1977. She remained active in film and television well into the 1980s. Sadly, this great actress died in 1991 at the young age of 55. Jim Hutton played young Captain Paul Slater. I briefly talked about Hutton in episode 11, The Green Beret, 1968, but he deserves a little more attention. Jim Hutton was born in upstate New York in 1934. He was a little wild and said to have attended five or six different schools. He eventually got a journalism scholarship to Syracuse University, but quickly became interested in acting, which resulted in him leaving prior to graduation. He also flunked out of Niagara College, but did manage to perform in summer stock programs. He spent about a year living in Greenwich Village, trying to get stage work to no avail. On the verge of starvation, he joined the U.S. Army. He was assigned to special services, never to be confused with special forces. In Berlin, he founded the American Community Theater and starred in most of its productions. A director saw him on the stage in The Cane Mutiny, 1954, and offered him a movie role. Hutton shot A Time to Love and A Time to Die, 1958, while on leave from the Army for 22 days. Universal offered him a contract, but Hutton still had a year and a half of his enlistment. 
By the time he made it to Hollywood, the offer was gone. Eventually, he would sign with MGM. Hutton had some very small roles in 1959 and 60 until he knocked it out of the park as a zany T.B. Thompson in Where the Boys Are, 1960. In this movie, he was paired with the lovely Paula Prentice, and the pair made a great, very tall couple. Hutton and Prentice were paired three more times, but they never found the magic again. The movies were The Honeymoon Machine, 1961, Bachelor in Paradise, 1961, and The Horizontal Lieutenant, 1962. Following these flops, Hutton tried to get better roles, and this resulted in him being away from film for 15 months. Finally, Hutton appeared in Looking for Love, 1964 with Connie Francis. Francis was also in Where the Boys Are, 1960. Free from his contract at MGM, Hutton played a young lieutenant in the Sam Peckinpah-directed mess known as Major Dundee, 1965. Before you start, I didn't say it wasn't fun to watch, just a mess. This was followed by the Hallelujah Trail 1965, where Hutton played a young lieutenant opposite his commander played wonderfully by Burt Lancaster. He had a very small but funny, uncredited role in The Trouble with Angels 1966. That same year, he was in the Laugh-A-Minute Walk, Don't Run 1966 with Cary Grant. Hutton was also in a farcical heist film, Who's Minding the Mint 1967. Hutton teamed up with John Wayne for a couple of real stinkers, Hell Fighters 1968, and the Green Berets 1968, where he played a young sergeant. Again, I didn't say they weren't fun to watch. It seems like those two Duke movies ended Hutton's film career. He switched to television and did well until he hit it big again with the detective series Ellery Queen 1975-76. He also started working in theater and had a reunion with his son from his second marriage, actor Tim Hutton. Sadly, Jim Hutton died of liver cancer in 1979 at the age of 45. Donald Pleasant played the booze-inspired seer Oracle Jones. Pleasant was born in 1919 in England. He went to work in the rail business, but was accepted as an assistant stage manager on the Isle of Jersey in 1939. World War II interrupted his plans, and he joined the Royal Air Force. He was shot down over France and suffered in a German prisoner of war camp. Following the war, Pleasant returned to London and began working in the theater. Pleasant had his first credited role in The Beachcomber, 1954, but it would be almost a decade before his talents were fully recognized. To American audiences, the movie that would get him this attention was the star-studded POW escape film, The Great Escape, 1963. Pleasant played a forager that slowly goes blind as the escape draws nearer. Some of his movie highlights include A Bloodthirsty Preacher in Will Penny, 1967, The Cat-Stroking Evil Genius in You Only Live Twice, 1967, which was the model for Dr. Evil, An Alcoholic in the Australian Drama, Wake and Fright, 1971, Lord Thomas Cromwell in Henry VIII and His Six Wives, 1972, Nazi Heinrich Himmler in The Eagle Has Landed, 1976, a sleuthing psychiatrist in Halloween 1978 and most of the sequels, and the president in Escape from New York 1981. Pleasant died in 1995 at the age of 75. Martin Landau played Chief Walk Stooped Over. Landau was born in 1928 in Brooklyn, New York. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! At 17, he became a cartoonist for the New York Daily News. By 1951, he was doing stage work way off Broadway. In 1955, Landau and Steve McQueen were the only students admitted to Lee Strasberg's actor's studio. Soon, Landau was working mostly on stage and in television. His first movie role was in Porkchop Hill, 1959, starring Gregory Peck. That same year, Landau hit it big playing a sadistic killer in North by Northwest, 1959, with Cary Grant. He had another good performance in Cleopatra 1963. However, Landau remained primarily a television actor and did very well there. Producer Gene Roddenberry wanted Landau to play Mr. Spock on Star Trek 1966-69, but Landau was already committed to his most famous television show, Mission Impossible 1966-73. However, Landau left the show in 1969 over a contract dispute and was replaced by Leonard Nimoy, the man that got the role of Mr. Spock. Landau continued to work in film and television, 
but it seemed his best days were gone. He came back with a vengeance, though, in the Francis Ford Coppola-directed Tucker, The Man in His Dreams, 1988, and Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors, 1989. Martin Landau received an Oscar nomination for both films. However, he had one more great performance to give. He played Bella Lugosi in the Tim Burton-directed Ed Wood, 1994, and was amazing. At the age of 89, Landau is still working. Story. The movie begins in the Rocky Mountains with a narrator, John Denner, describing what is happening out west in late 1867 and tells the reason behind the story. The Civil War had ended and hardened U.S. cavalry patrolled the west. On the reservations, the Indians are being issued war surplus rifles. There were signs everywhere that it was going to be a harsh winter. Miners are shown walking across the street in Denver, and it is said by the narrator that their actions led to the Battle of Whiskey Hills and the disaster at Quicksand Bottoms. At the miners' meeting held in the saloon, Clayton Howell, Dub Taylor, tells the men that there are only 10 days of whiskey left in the city. Clayton says they need a plan. One of the miners suggests that they talk to Oracle Jones, Donald Pleasant. A sunburned Oracle is playing solitary in the back of the saloon. When they give him whiskey, he says it's going to be a long winter. The more he drinks, the clearer his vision of the future becomes. Blue, no supplies and no whiskey. You know. Yep. Come on me two days ago. we got to have a plan. Yeah. What kind of plan, Oracle? Uh, now, let me just... Uh, oh, I see it. I see all of us coming together. I um, I see us uh, putting all the whiskey orders into one big shipment for the whole winter. He says they should combine all of the whiskey orders into one and get a guarantee from the seller. He sees 40 wagons coming with whiskey. Back in Julesburg, the whiskey contractor, Frank Wallingham, Brian Keith, storms into the newspaper offices and demands to know from editor Hobbs, Whit Bissell, why he printed a story about the whiskey. Hobbs says it's news. Then Wallingham asks, what if the Indians get word of the shipment? Hobbs replies, Indians don't read newspapers. Wallingham then asks about revenues to which Hobbs accuses him of not paying his federal taxes. Wallingham says he is an honest businessman and a good Republican. All right, then, worse than Indians. Paid your federal taxes, huh? Of course I pay my taxes. I'm an honest businessman. And a good Republican. Wallingham also says he is going to accompany the wagons himself. Wallingham says he will be asking for an army escort. When he leaves, Hobbs sends a telegram to temperance marcher Cora Templeton Massingale, Lee Remick, who, as luck would have it, is currently at Fort Russell. They show a montage of Native American messaging, from smoke signals to hides to tied knots. In 48 hours, every Plains Indian tribe was aware of the shipment. Sioux Chief Five Barrels, Robert J. Wilkie, and his sub-chief, Chief Chief Falk Stooped Over, Martin Landau, met with the Chief of the Crow to decide who would recon the wagons. Finally, Chief Five Barrels clubs the Crow Chief over the head to end negotiations. Meanwhile, back at Fort Russell, Cora Templeton has organized a temperance meeting. The commander, Colonel Thaddeus Gerhardt, Bert Lancaster, is out on patrol and has left Captain Paul Slater, Jim Hutton, in charge. Slater is dating Colonel Gerhardt's daughter, Louise, Pamela Tifton. The ladies begin marching and singing and are escorted by the troops and the regimental band. When Colonel Gerhardt and his troops ride into hearing distance, Sergeant Buell, John Anderson, thinks it is an Indian war cry. They hear bugles and charge towards the fort. The men in the fort are so excited by the singing that they begin firing the cannons. Gerhardt and company ride in ready to fight. The drawn guns kind of put a damper on the singing. Gerhardt arrests the band and orders the cannon firers to report to his office in the morning. When he finds out that Slater allowed the rally to take place, he orders the captain to his quarters. He is shocked when he finds Slater making out with his daughter by the fire. Louise says she was making out with Slater so he wouldn't stop the rally. Louise says she will stand with Cora and storms out. The colonel is okay with Slater dating his daughter and gives him the order to escort Wallingham's wagons, saying he is a taxpayer and a good Republican. 
Gerhardt settles down to take a bath, smoke a cigar, and drink whiskey. As soon as he gets comfortable, Cora comes in and demands that the colonel not send the military escort for the whiskey wagon train. He says he has to because Wallingham is a taxpayer and a good Republican. Cora says she will be forced to take action. The next morning, Slater and his troops head out to intercept the wagon train. The wagon train was moving along the north side of the South Platte River. The last ten wagons were driven by Irish Teamsters. The leader was Kevin O'Flaherty, Tom Stern, and he was more concerned with striking for better working conditions than moving the wagons. Chief Five Barrels is leading his band in search of the wagon. It is at this time that the movie mentions Chief Walk Stooped Over is sometimes called Sky Eyes because of his blue eyes. Chief Scar in The Searchers 1956 was cast as blue-eyed German actor Henry Brandon. The colonel's daughter begins badgering him to let Cora have one more temperance meeting in the mess hall. Cora announces in the meeting that she is heading to Denver to meet the wagons of whiskey. Louise and the other ladies decide to all go to Denver. Although Sergeant Buell has doubled the guards, the women break out and start marching. The cannons start firing again. In the morning, the colonel has a bad hangover. His daughter brings him coffee, and Cora comes in and starts caring for him. She starts massaging his neck and soon has control. So Cora gets the wagon she needs and a large military escort that includes the colonel. There are disgruntled husbands waiting at the gate because their wives are going along. In Denver, the miners have another meeting. They take their last bottle of whiskey to Oracle, who is playing solitary in the back of the saloon. The more he drinks, the better his vision. He sees Indians and men on the march. Someone says cavalry, to which he replies, This ain't no time for children. The thought of no whiskey for the winter sends the Denver miners' militia out looking for the wagon train. So, we have the miners, two troops of cavalry, the temperance ladies, and the Indians all converging on the wagon train. When a wheel falls off of Flaherty's wagon, Wallingham asks him, what's his excuse this time? Quote, you ignorant immigrant lump, unquote. O'Flaherty issues a set of labor demands and implies he will strike. At this time, Captain Slater and his troops arrive to escort the wagon. Wallingham asks about Indians and seems more scared when he hears the name Cora Templeton Massingale. One night, the ladies from the temperance movement start taking baths and all of the soldier escorts climb trees to watch. Gerhardt busts in where Cora is taking a bath just like she did to him earlier. Cora tells the colonel that the temperance women are going to intercept the whiskey wagon train before it gets to Denver. He says he will not escort her on her crazy scheme to stop the wagon. Gerhardt comes up with a detached contact plan where they will shadow the temperance women from a distance without directly traveling with them. The Indians find the wagon and make a plan to attack when the sun is two hands high over Iron Mountain. They divide into three groups. Naturally, a giant sandstorm hits in the morning before all of the groups converge. Oracle can't see without whiskey. The Indians can't figure out what time to attack. And Wallingham thinks he hears temperance singing. All of the groups are passing each other in the storm but never making contact. The miners... The whiskey wagons and the Irish separately all form circles. Shooting starts and bullets fly in all directions. Slater has his men firing in two directions, protecting both rears simultaneously. The movie shows the position of each group at the Battle of Whiskey Hills, but it is nonsense because you can't tell where anyone is located. When the storm ends, no one has been shot. Gerhardt decides to hold a conference. All parties come in, including the Indians. Wallingham says he is a taxpayer and a good Republican. Clayton Howell wants to take the cargo to Denver. Oracle says he is there as a guide. O'Flaherty tries to turn it into a labor negotiation. A problem comes up if the Irish don't drive. If the miners drive, they are such bad barflies that they will need soldiers to guard them, and then the soldiers will need to be guarded as well. Cora says she wants the whiskey dump. Chief Walk stooped over says they were peacefully hunting buffaloes and they want presents. Gerhardt thinks they want to give him a present and he says no thanks and sends them on their way. Five Barrels wants 20 wagons of whiskey. Gerhardt shakes their hands and the Indians think they have a deal. The combined groups head for Denver with the Indians following. All the groups settle down for the night and make camp and the colonel finds his men preparing a bath for him, compliments of Cora. The colonel, the sergeant, and Oracle go to the Indians 
and find out they are waiting for their presence, 20 wagons of crazy water. Oracle breaks into a whiskey wagon and has another vision. Oracle tells Wallingham to head his wagons towards Quicksand Bottoms. They camp there that night with the Indians still following and camping nearby. O'Flaherty goes on strike and takes 10 wagons, making their own circle. The temperance ladies have joined the Irish strike, and Wallingham and the miners are prepared to take the whiskey back to Denver. The cavalry tries to stand between the two groups. That night, the temperance ladies go to the Indian camp and have a nice sing-along. The Indians all sign temperance papers. The band sneaks in and joins the singing. Cora goes back to the wagon to hand out axes and hammers to the other ladies. In the middle of the meeting, the Indians capture the women and disarm Slater's men. The Indians demand the 20 wagons of whiskey. Gerhardt declares martial law. It is against the law to give Indians whiskey. Cora says she has a woman in each wagon ready to destroy the whiskey. Gerhardt agrees to the 20 wagons for the women. Oracle goes into the swamp to do something. Colonel Gerhardt goes back to his tent for a bath. Cora comes in and feels bad that she has ruined Gerhardt's career. Cora begins to cry before having a few drinks of whiskey. The two are about to kiss when Slater comes in with Chief Walk stooped over and says they have agreed to 10 wagons for the women the number controlled by O'Flaherty and the Irish. Cora gives the colonel a kiss before she drunkenly walks back to her tent. Oracle comes out of the swamp and tells Wallingham he has marked a path through the swamp with stakes and tied on strips of his red underwear. The plan is to take the 30 wagons through the swamp and leave the women, the cavalry, the Irish, and the Indians behind. Cora finds out about the stakes and has some of her ladies move them around. Everyone meets for the wagon exchange at dawn. O'Flaherty tells Cora that the tin wagons are filled with champagne that will explode if it gets hot and is shaken. Mr. Maskell, we have a bit of a problem. Chief Five Barrels insists on taking the first wagon, and his brother-in-law the second wagon, and his second brother-in-law the third wagon, and Elks Runner the fourth wagon. Now that doesn't leave anybody in charge on their side. Me in charge. You? You, you, you speak our tongue? I speak with straight tongue. Me in charge, good. Drink later. Cora decides to stick a hat pin in the butt of each horse on the team. As each team comes forward, a horse gets stuck. The champagne starts exploding. The other teams get so excited they take off running. Trying to catch the wagons, the Indians let the other women go free. The cavalry chases the wagons and think the champagne explosions are gunfire. Wallingham tries to move out into the swamp with the 30 wagons, but they charge towards the other wagons before they can be turned around. With the route changed, in the quicksand, the wagons quickly sink, but the horses and men are rescued. The cavalry starts firing at the Indians, who form their remaining wagons in a circle while the cavalry rides around outside. The Indians decide to surrender and go home drunk with a few remaining bottles of champagne. Wallingham is financially destroyed, having lost his cargo. The temperance ladies are marching back to Fort Russell. They have a double wedding at the fort. Slater marries Louise, and Gerhardt marries Cora who quits the temperance movement. Oracle and Wallingham build a little house by the quicksand and wait for the barrels of whiskey to slowly surface. The miners return to Denver and live through one of the mildest winters in history. World famous short summary, May December couple find each other on a western trip. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I'm on just about all the social media, but Twitter is my main place. You can find the links in the show notes. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware of the moors. Oh my, I need a review.